<clears throat> so if you're looking at erythropoiesis, it's amazing that 200 billion erythrocytes are made each day. And normal erythropoiesis requires bone marrow stem cells, element lion, cytokines including erythropoietin, vitamins, a suitable marrow microenvironment. And deficiency of these key components can lead to decreased RBC production and consequent anemia. The simple definition of an acquired underproduction anemia is the presence of anemia associated with a low reticulocyte count is corrected to less than two. I've given you the formula to work that out. This is a rather busy slide, but I try to capture the different ways one could have anemias. What is amazing when I was looking at these slides last night is that this one slide encaptures about 100 years of hematological work and involves the the expertise and skills of hundreds of world-renowned hematologists. So the mechanisms of disturbed hemoglobin synthesis are heme and globin chains, the alpha and beta, are manufactured in separate cell compound compartments, the mitochondria and cytoplasm respectively, and then combined in an amazingly accurate manner. Several major problems can occur during this process. Qualitative defects of globin chain synthesis result in hemoglobinopathies, good example being sickle cell disease. Quantitative, defect, qu quantitative defects of globin chain synthesis can result in thalassemias. Defects involving the incorporation of iron into the heme molecule result in the so-called sideroblastic anemias. Defects in both the synthesis of heme and incorporation of iron can result in a porphyria with sideroblastic features. Defects in supply of nutrients and catalysts to the hemoglobin synthesis cause underproduction anemias, iron B12 folic acid, which is what we focus on today. Defects in mechanisms that provide integrity to the red cell membrane cause hemolytic anemias. Defects in red cell production or maturation causes marrow failure or dysplastic syndromes, consequent uh, anemias. Acquired underproduction anemias can be, in very simple terms, classified by RBC size into microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic. And this is a figure that shows one the approach to the different types of anemia using the peripheral smear and the MCV as the starting point, and then go into the differential diagnosis. I'm not going to go into the details. I'm sure any of you are familiar with this approach, and we will cover that in the rest of the slides this morning. So looking at microcytic anemias, let's work through some cases to help us uh, understand this better. 22-year-old man presents to his primary care provider complaining of increasing fatigue and dyspnea on exertion. Laboratory tests reveal a microcytic anemia with a hemoglobin of 7.4, an MCV of 74, and reticulocyte count of 1%. White count is normal and platelet count is normal. The differential diagnosis for this patient includes all of the following, except iron deficiency anemia, inflammatory anemia, thalassemic syndromes, sideroblastic anemia, and refractory anemia, or malodysplastic syndrome. All A to D are differential diagnosis for microcytic hypochromic anemia. E is the wrong answer. Further studies on this patient were done and show low serum iron high total iron binding capacity, and low ferritin levels. The peripheral smear is shown. What this peripheral smear shows you is pallor. There is more, the central pallor is more than one-third the diameter of the red cell. You see these elongated red cells. This is typical of a microcytic hypochromic anemia, classic iron deficiency anemia. So the differential diagnosis of a microcytic hypochromic anemia it require some tests to be done. Importantly, one looks at the blood smear, serum iron, TIBC, person saturation, ferritin, and the hemoglobin pattern. And using these, you can most of the time differentiate between iron deficiency, inflammatory, thalassemia, and sideroblastic anemia. Although I must admit, many a time uh, there will be difficulty because of the nuances of these laboratory tests, which we will outline later. <clears throat> so this represents the system, the iron homeostasis. And what it shows is that iron is stored in various sites, 
and the numbers are given. Most of the iron is stored in the liver and then circulated in the bone marrow through the red cells, the reticular endothelial system. And what I'm going to show in the subsequent two slides is how complex iron metabolism is. And we are now beginning to recognize disorders of these pathways that lead to different types of anemia. The key molecule here, one has the take-home molecule, if I may, is hepcidin. Hepcidin is synthesized by the liver and is regulated by negative regulatory pathways and positive regulatory pathways. And it has control over the duodenal uptake, the reticuloendothelial release, and the bone marrow act release and incorporation of iron into the erythroid cells. So hepcidin is now considered the master molecule that regulates iron metabolism. And again, it shows how complex the regulation of hepatocellular hepcidin is. It's controlled by events in, in the bone marrow and the kidney. It's controlled by the iron status, the circulating iron and iron stores, and is also mediated by inflammation and the release of cytokines, which increase the production of hepcidin molecules. And as you would see in the subsequent slides, in anemia of chronic disease, this is where the problem is. Inflammation, IL-6, hepcidin overexpression, hepcidin prevents iron from cycling normally, causes anemia of chronic disease. We're also recognizing that there are many other points of control uh, that may also cause different types of anemia. For example, there is a condition where hepcidin molecule is not produced because of problem in, in, the, in, the, in the gene that controls hepcidin. And because of that, these patients have iron deficiency anemia, but are refractory to iron therapy. It's called iron refractory iron deficiency anemia. We're beginning to recognize newer and newer conditions uh, of iron metabolism. Causes of iron deficiency anemia include blood loss, increased iron requirements, and an inadequate iron supply. And you can see there are various causes for each. Blood loss we all are familiar with. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but one of the common things tested in the American Board of Internal Medicine is dialysis, causing iron deficiency anemia and intravascular hemolysis. So pay attention to those rarer causes. Increase iron requirements, pay particular attention to erythropoietin therapy causing iron deficiency anemia often asked in the exams. Inadequate iron supply, poor dietary intake, and malabsorption due to a variety of causes, especially celiac disease, gastric bypass, and inflammatory bowel disease. So we have a 64-year-old lady who was referred to a hematologist because of unrespons unresponsiveness to oral iron therapy. And some of the hematology oncology fellows in the audience. This is a common referral we get. Laboratory tests reveal microcytic hyperchromic anemia, low serum iron, high TIBC, low ferritin, and a low iron saturation value. She had been on oral iron therapy for several months with no improvement in hemoglobin. Which of the following needs to be considered as being responsible for the failure to respond to oral iron therapy? Autoimmune gastritis. H. pylori infection, occult blood loss, celiac disease, and all of the above. All of the above. And I'll explain that to them in the few slides ahead. Causes of failure to respond to oral iron therapy, an often seen problem, is ongoing bleeding, poor patient compliance, poor iron absorption due to a variety of causes as outlined in the previous questionnaire, inadequate replacement dosing, and appropriateness of the diagnosis. So this brings up the limitations of iron studies. Many a time, iron de deficiency anemia does not present classically. Routine iron studies has its own limitations. Serum ferritin, serum iron, TIBC, and transferrin vary in amount depending upon infect inflammation, and they are acute phase reactants, so they can mislead us. We have to be intensely aware of that. So what are the additional studies one could do 
when you suspect iron deficiency, but the classic tests do not reveal the answer. Well, we don't have any absolute alternatives, but these are some of the problems with some of the alternatives. Increased red cell distribution width is, pos is a useful tool, but it lacks specificity. Erythro erythrocyte zinc protoporphyrin levels, but it lacks specificity for, its, for it is increased in lead poisoning, anemia of chronic disease, and some of the hemoglobin disorders. What about soluble transferrin receptor? Well, it lacks standardization and is not widely available. The levels are increased in iron deficiency and anemias with ineffective erythropoiesis, so it's not very specific. A ratio of soluble transferrin factor to ferritin has shown more promise and may be more useful in distinguishing anemia of chronic disease from iron deficiency. What about serum hepcidin? As I had outlined in the previous, serum hepcidin levels would be low in iron deficiency, uh, but it is not yet available in routine clinical practice. What about bone marrow iron estimation? Could that serve a purpose here? It used to be considered the gold standard in the past. It's, it has high inter-observer variability. It's expensive and is an invasive procedure. It is not really done in common hematology practice. What about an iron trial? Well, it has a role in selected clinical situations given the above challenges of not having an absolute set of laboratory tests to document this diagnosis. So always consider that. A few, few words about iron replacement therapy. Again, it is one of the uh, ABIM high value questions that are there in the hematology section of the uh, MIXAP. Oral iron salts are a safe first line therapy. No evidence to suggest that a particular iron preparation is superior. Typical oral replacement is 100 to 200 milligrams of elemental iron per day for adults. Duration of iron therapy to continue for three months beyond normalization of hemoglobin. Typical side effects we are all familiar with include GI, GI effects, nausea, epigastric discomfort, and constipation. About 25% of patients would show oral intolerance. Antacids, tannins, calcium salts can decrease the absorption. <coughs> so what is preferred replacement is oral, but sometimes we have to use intravenous iron therapy. Although there is a tendency to overuse this in practice, we have to use strict criteria before we use intravenous iron therapy. The indications would be an absolute intolerance to oral iron, non-compliance to oral iron, high iron requirements as in dialysis patients, or intestinal malabsorption due to a variety of causes, celiac disease, or autoimmune gastritis, etc. <clears throat> the parenteral iron preparations, there's an increasing use because of erythropoietin use. The available preparations, we used to only have one preparation years ago, iron dextran, which had uh, high incidence of anaphylaxis and is not very popular. Since then, there have been less anaphylactoid preparations, sodium ferrigluconate, iron sucrose, and newer preparations with rapid infusion times are being developed. There are two ways to give IV iron, a total dose, or repeated small doses weekly. Many of us prefer the small dose weekly uh, in, uh, instead of the total dose. A simple old test that a good hematologist teacher of mine years ago told me, still useful, uh, it's called the iron absorption test. It's a useful test at times in the evaluation of iron deficiency. Distinguishes an intestinal iron absorption defect from other causes of iron deficiency. Patient fast for eight hours, measure baseline serum iron, and at 90 minutes after administration of ferrous sulfate at five milligrams per kilogram, you can check the iron levels. And is expected, the serum iron is expected to increase by at least 50 micrograms per deciliter in 90 minutes. Situation, I've used this often in gastric bypass surgery, patients I suspect of celiac disease who don't respond to oral iron. This is a useful tool before you plunge in and give IV iron. So much for microcytic anemias. Let's move on to normocytic anemias. A 44-year-old lady is referred for evaluation of a normocytic anemia with a hemoglobin of 8 grams per deciliter. Her past history is significant for mitral valve replacement one year earlier. Recently, she has developed low-grade fevers, malaise, and generalized fatigue. Her examination is remarkable for a temperature of 38.5. 
and a 2 by 6 systolic ejection murmur over the mitral area. Laboratory tests reveal a decreased serum ion, low TIBC and low percent iron saturation at 18 percent. Serum ferritin is 55 and ESR is elevated 92. Blood cultures return positive for alpha hemolytic strep. Transesophageal echocardiography confirms SBE of the prosthetic mitral valve. Patient is treated with pen and gen. Four weeks later, hemoglobin improves to 11 grams per deciliter. This patient was diagnosed to have anemia of chronic disease, AOCD. The pathophysiological factors involved in this type of anemia include all of the following except cytokines like interleukin-6, interleukin-1, and TNF-alpha, an alteration in iron metabolism, hepcidin, and iron or iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is not incriminated uh, in the pathophysiology of anemia of chronic disease. There is excess iron, but it's in the wrong place. Anemia of iron, chronic disease is due to impaired iron utilization. Iron stores are normal to increased. Interleukin-6 hepcidin decreased GI absorption causes decreased release of iron from the macrophages and hence hinders erythropoiesis. Normocytic normochromic red cells are seen. There's low retic count. And the classic uh, iron indices are low iron, low TIBC, high ferritin or normal and Soluble transferrin receptor is normal. I think I've shown this slide. Anemia is common in chronic inflammatory conditions as outlined there. Recently recognized that in addition to above, anemia of chronic disease can also be seen in trauma, post surgery, and prolonged critical illness. The hallmark of anemia of chronic disease is altered iron metabolism. Inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 cause an increase in liver hepcidin, the key regulator of iron transmembrane transport as shown in slides earlier. Hepcidin binds the iron export protein ferropotin leading to its degradation and hence failure to absorb the iron. Cytokines cause reduction in proliferation of erythroid precursors in response to erythropoietin. There is decrease in production of erythropoietin relative to the degree of anemia and there is also moderate decrease in red cell survival. So the important question is, anemia of chronic disease being so common, is there a way to treat other than giving them erythropoietin? Well, this is an experiment that's published in blood very recently, where now we have antibodies against hepcidin. So the idea is to block the excess hepcidin and facilitate iron absorption and solve the problem of anemia of chronic disease. Well, they've done this successfully in mice. And this is a, a diagram illustrating the pathophysiological way in which this works. So if you have the neutralizing antibody, monoclonal antibody, you can block, uh, relieve this block that hepcidin induces in the iron cycling. And that was successfully shown in mice. Experiments are now being conducted in clinical trials in humans. The efficacy of epsidin antagonist in treating iron-restricted anemia in humans remains to be tested in clinical trials, several of which are in progress. Additional therapeutic options may soon become available for patients with anemias associated with kidney disease, cancer, and other inflammatory conditions. Several approaches to antagonize hepcidin are currently under development. The generation of anti hepcidin antibodies and methods to neutralize the hepcidin protein by anti-hepcidin antibodies or engineered hepcidin binders. So we're going to have to wait for these clinical trials to see this will work. So AOCD is the most common anemia in patients with underlying inflammatory disease. It is characterized by lower retic count corrected, normocytic or microcytic anemia. Always remember the differential is iron deficiency. Decreased serum iron, decreased transferrin, normal or increased ferritin. And the pathophysiology is multifactorial. Treatment should be directed at the underlying medical condition for now. Case four, 70 year old woman presents to a primary care physician with increasing dyspnea on exertion. She's found to have a hemoglobin of nine grams per deciliter, creatinine of 2.2, MCV is normal, 
and retic count is 1.5. Iron studies are normal. She was started on ESAs, erythropoiesis stimulating agents, along with an oral iron supplement. Within four weeks, she had a good response. However, two months later, she returns with recurrent dyspnea. Lab studies show hemoglobin of 9 and an MCV of 77. Failure to respond to erythropoietin therapy could be due to resistance to erythropoietin, onset of iron deficiency, coexistent infection, coexistent folate deficiency, or all of the above. So we were referring to anemia of renal disease. Renal disease is the prototypical disorder of erythropoietin deficiency. And ESAs are effective treatment of anemia associated with chronic kidney disease. Causes of failure to respond to ESA in patients with kidney disease include true or functional iron deficiency, folic acid deficiency, coexistent infection or inflammation, and ongoing bleeding or hemolytic process, and development of anti-erythropoietin antibodies and pure red cell aplasia, although those are very rare. The common case reports came out of Europe because of use of a different type of erythropoietin preparation. But uh, it's worth keeping it in mind when all other causes have been searched for, for not to be. It's rare. So this is for the boards. Commonly residents come and ask me what is a burst cell and what is an acanthocyte. So I've tried to bring a slide together where you have both, both uh, in the same slide. So burst cell is one with regular, let me see which one, very blunted regular projections. An acanthocyte is these irregular spinous projections. And sometimes, as you can see here, it both can be seen in some diseases, classic example being liver disease. Classic acanthocytes predominantly would be seen in certain disorders, acanthocytes with A beta lipoproteinemia, and Burst cells are classically seen on its own in renal disease. I think this slide projects better here. So that's an acanthocyte. You can see these irregular projections, and these are Burst cells. Moving on to macrocytic anemias. A 75-year-old man is referred for investigation of anemia. He has been treated by transurethral resection and intravesical BCG for TCC of his bladder. He has type 2 diabetes and is on metformin. He is pale, has mild peripheral edema, and minimal loss of position and vibratory sense in the feet bilaterally. Laboratory tests reveal a hemoglobin of 7, MCV of 135, neutrophil count of 500, platelet count of 35,000. Serum B12 level is 72, serum folate is normal. He started on parenteral cobalamin replacement with brisk reticulocytosis noted in one week. The following are true statements in this patient except metformin can cause B12 deficiency in this man. True or false? True. Serum potassium levels can decrease due to B12 replacement. He may require iron replacement in addition while on B12 replacement. Neuro neurological symptoms and signs are irreversible. Okay. So cobalamin and folate deficiency are the commonest causes of megaloblastic anemia leading to macrocytosis. It's characterized by low corrected reticulocyte count, marked macrocytosis, certain classic Red cell abnormalities, including macrovellocytes, hypersegmented neutrophils, megaloblastic changes in the bone marrow. There is what is described as nuclear cytoplasmic asynchrony in bone marrow erythropoiesis, and intramedullary cell death, as represented by high LDH, unconjugated bilirubin, and low haptoglobin. So here is a hypersegmented neutrophil, easily recognizable. If you count the lobes, I think there are at least eight of them. And this is a megaloblastic bone marrow. If you can look at the nucleus, it has this immature sieve-like appearance sitting right in the middle. This is a better example. This is a classic megaloblastic nucleus. And also you can see the nucleocytoplasmic asynchrony because this is 
less blue than some of the other cells, which means it's beginning to get hemoglobinized, but the nucleus is still in the central when it should be near extrusion. So that's nucleocytoplasmic asynchrony. These are some of the features of megaloblastic anemia. Selected causes of B12 deficiency. The commonest causes of B12 deficiency are because of problems in absorption. The commonest causes of folic acid deficiency are because of poor intake. Impaired absorption includes hypochlorhydria, pancreatic insufficiency, fish tapeworm infestation, deficiency of intrinsic fat are leading to pernicious anemia, gastric bypass surgery, decreased ileal absorption, Crohn's disease, and medications. The me mechanism of metformin's um, B12 deficiency is not really known. Insufficient dietary intake, not often the cause, but can be seen, and defects in transport of the B12 can all cause B12 deficiency. Just like iron deficiency um, testing, B12 deficiency testing is not absolute, and there are problems with the, the tests and the interpretation. There is no diagnostic gold standard. Each laboratory test has its disadvantages. A low serum B12 level less than 200 is 97% sensitive. The levels more than 300 speak against. Methyl malonic acid and homocysteine are indicators of early deficiency. Both increase before serum cobalamin levels fall. Homocysteine levels lack specificity, are uh, increased in folic acid deficiency in addition. A new test is being developed called HOLO-TC, HOLO-transcobalamin. It measures cobalamin bound to transcobalamin, and thus cobalamin available for tissue delivery. It is not widely available, and the use is not clear as yet. The classic example of cobalamin deficiency is pernicious anemia. Secondary to atrophy of gastric mucus, are often seen in more than 50 years, is an autoimmune disorder. It's characterized by the generation of autoantibodies against intrinsic factor, antiparietal cell antibodies. It has got other immune disorders that are associated with it, thyroid disease, vitiligo, and type 1 diabetes. The new finding is before it used to be thought that this is a pure autoimmune disease generated by an immune dysregulation. But recent studies show that long-standing H. pylori infection thought to cause atrophic gastritis can lead to pernicious anemia, an example of pathogen-induced organ-specific autoimmunity. Pernicious anemia patients have increased risk of gastric cancer, carcinoid. Schilling tests used to be done before to isolate where it is absorbed, but it's hardly done. Most labs do not have facilities to do Schilling tests anymore. Case six, 55-year-old man presents for routine physical exam. He complains of fatigue and shortness of breath. He admits to daily excess alcohol consumption since he lost his job six months ago. Examination reveals pallor, glossitis, flow murmur, and a normal neurological exam. Lab evaluation reveals a hemoglobin at 7.1, high MCV at 130, low ANC at 450. Serum folate is very low at one nanogram per mil. Cobalamin level is 350. He started on an alcohol rehab program and folate replacement. Symptomatic improvement and brisk reticulocytosis is noted in two weeks. The following are true or false about this disorder. Hematological manifestations of folate deficiency are indistinguishable from cobalamin deficiency. True. Commonest causes of folic cash deficiency are due to poor intake and not due to poor absorption. Folic acid replacement can partially reverse the hematological abnormalities and the neurological problems due to B12 deficiency. False. It can correct the hematological abnormalities, but it can worsen the neurological problems. Ethyl malonic acid is normal in folate deficiency. So some of the select causes of folate deficiency focus on the poor intake, poor nutrition, old age, the the so-called tea and toast diet, alcoholism, prolonged hyperalimentation, lack of food fortification. One of the questions they often ask in the exams, they love this, is folic acid requirements are increased in certain situations. So they can be, you can be tested on any of these conditions. I remember when I took my internal medicine boards years ago, 
there was a question on folic acid deficiency due to exfoliative dermatitis or some exfoliative psoriatic process. So remember those. Serum folate level may be normal after a single folate containing meal. Therefore, measurement of RBC folate may be a better indicator of long term folate balance. This is so true in the hospital. Sometimes you'll have, you'll suspect folic acid deficiency, you'll have a hospital meal, and for all you know, the folic acid levels are normal. Elevated homocysteine has a sensitivity and specificity more than 90% in the diagnosis of folate deficiency when serum folate is normal and the disorder is suspected. A therapeutic trial of folate may be required after cobalamin deficiency is excluded, maybe the most cost effective way. A 71 year old lady is evaluated for fatigue and a five pound weight loss over the past two months. The patient's past medical history is remarkable for breast cancer, treated with lumpectomy, radiation, and adjuvant chemotherapy with an anthracycline containing regime one year ago. Examination is remarkable for ill appearance, supraclavicular adenopathy. The CBC shows a hemoglobin of 8, an MCV of 85, a retic count of 3%, a white count of 2,000, platelet count of 100,000. We look at the blood smear and it shows nucleated red cells, teardrop forms, giant platelets, immature leukocytes, rare blasts, and bone marrow exam is attempted, but it's unsuccessful and is a dry tap. The likely diagnosis in this patient is acute myelogenous leukemia, myelothesic anemia, metastatic carcinoma, hairy cell leukemia, or tuberculosis. What we're trying to cover here is bone marrow infiltration by other cells outside of the bone marrow. And there are a variety of causes. And the blood smear uh, description that I gave you is what is described as a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. What is meant by that is the presence of immature red cells and immature white cells and teardrop cells in the peripheral smear. Nucleated red cell, immature white cell. And this is a tip off of bone marrow infiltration by non-hematopoietic cells of variety of causes, starting from malignancy to storage diseases, osteopetrosis, and variety of other causes. So normocytic normochromic anemia due to replacement of marrow space by non-hematopoietic or abnormal cells. It's characterized by low corrected reticulocyte count anemia, thrombocytopenia, and low normal neutrophil count. And the smear reveals a leukoerythroblastic blood picture. Myelothysic anemia or marrow infiltrative process can be seen in malignancy, granulomas, lipid storage disorders, hairy cell leukemia, osteopetrosis. Case 7. A 42-year-old lady complains of severe fatigue and lightheadedness after a first cycle of anthrocycline-based adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer. A hemoglobin is 7.2 grams, white count is 1, platelet count is 50. The following is true of a cancer-related anemia. Packed red cell transfusion is indicated. Regular use of erythropoietin is indicated to avoid further occurrence of the anemia. Erythropoietin use can be associated with increased cardiovascular events. All patients with cancer-related anemia should not receive erythropoietin. So packed red cell transfusion is indicated. Answer is yes. Regular use of erythropoietin is indicated to avoid further occurrence of the anemia. And the answer for reasons I will outline in the subsequent slides is wrong. Erythropoietin use can be associated with increased cardiovascular events. It's true. All patients with cancer-related anemia should not receive erythropoietin. And that's true. There are certain indications. We'll, uh, we'll go through that in a minute. So anemia of cancer. There are a variety of causes of anemia of cancer. The causes could be the cancer itself. There are particular types of cancer, perhaps, in large series that are more prone for anemia than others. But in general, all types of cancer can lead to normocytic normochromic anemia. Anemia can occur secondary to the effects of therapy, either chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Anemia can happen in cancer patients because of bone marrow infiltration. 
They could be associated autoimmune phenomena that drive the anemia, or there could be a microangiopathic process or nutritional deficiency. What I'm focused today is the use of erythropoietin, the anemia of cancer. You all remember the Procrit ads we have used to see on television before driving this business of giving Procrit for anemia of cancer patients. We had patients come and ask us, where's the, where, where's the Procrit? The advertisement process was so very vigorous that it captured the community. ESA use decreased transfusion requirements with some studies showing improvement in quality of life. ESA, however, caused tumor growth and shortened survival in advanced breast, head and neck, lymphoid, and non-small cell lung cancer, especially when a hemoglobin of 12 is targeted. Safety was therefore questioned in a large meta-analysis. Individual patient data from 13,933 patients with cancer treated on 53 controlled trials using ESAs versus standard of care. Analysis showed a 17% increase in mortality in ESA-treated patients during the active study period, a 10% increase in mortality when analysis was restricted. Studies included patients treated with chemotherapy. A recent analysis showed that ESAs do not increase the risk of tumor progression if used as per guidelines, except for a small increase in BTEs. So the societies, the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the American Society of Hematology have set out some guidelines on the restricted use of erythropoietin stimulating, erythropoiesis stimulating agents. Use lowest possible dose of ESA. Increase hemoglobin gradually to a level less than 12 grams per deciliter that will avoid transfusion. Not recommended for those in curative intent chemotherapy. For example, that patient on adjuvant therapy that I outlined, uh, we would not give erythropoietin at all. Not to be given for anemia of cancer, not related to use of concurrent chemotherapy. Patients with low risk myelodysplastic syndrome being the only exception. Combining erythropoietin stimulating agents with intravenous iron rather than oral iron improves response rate with no increase in complications. Moving on to another set of anemias, what we call dimorphic anemias. Two simultaneous populations of red cells typically of different size and hemoglobin content. And what I want to focus on is sideroblastic anemia, which can have a dimorphic blood picture. So sideroblastic anemia is primarily a laboratory diagnosis. It's important to establish that up front. It's very difficult to suspect that from clinical or laboratory indices. There may be clues, but there can never be concrete evidence. And one most of the time will have to do a bone marrow to establish the presence of sideroblastic anemia. What happens here is pathological accumulation of mitochondrial iron and erythroblast. There's insufficient production of protoporphyrin to utilize the iron that is delivered to erythroblast, or there are falls in the mitochondrial function that affect iron pathway or impair mitochondrial protein synthesis. A variety of causes are seen for sideroblastic anemia including medications, drugs, alcohol, and myelodysplastic syndromes. The establishment of the diagnosis is done when you suspect it and subject the bone marrow to Prussian blue iron staining, which will show you these sideroblasts. You can see the ring-shaped sideroblasts. These are all sideroblasts. It's a magnified view showing a better picture of that. Any question? Actually not. If you look at large uh, data, the original, the, there is a correlation between this, uh, between the creatinine and the uh, anemia. Certain levels. Thank you.